All right. Well, maybe maybe I'll start um, start with just a couple interim statements as as people are joining this last session here. Um, so welcome everybody to the final session of the Marine Seismic Symposium. Thanks for coming. I know um, I know I can say that I have found this meeting to be really a really great experience over the last couple of weeks. I hope I hope you all have too. It's been energizing for me, and I've um, I've had a great time seeing all of your faces, all of your familiar faces, and hearing your voices, as well as um, getting having the treat of getting updated on a, a lot of exciting science and technology. And I'm hoping that this last session can kind of keep that trend going for just a couple a couple more hours here before we um, disperse. Um, so yeah, I think I think this has been a, a really successful grassroots effort amidst all the challenges of the last year, and so um, and especially with the help of our fearless leader here, Casey, and and everybody who presented. Um, when we were anticipating the start of this final session um, last night, I uh, was thinking about trying to pull all of the names from all of the speakers and all of the contributors. And I was and all the poster presenters and all of the um, SIG leaders and I was I was completely overwhelmed um, by how many folks contributed to this meeting as not just as participants who were critically important, but also as you know, sharing some of your work or your ideas. So um, just one more time. I did this two weeks ago, but I'm going to I'm going to do it one more time and I'm going to stop sharing for just a quick second here and ask if you don't mind just turning on your video for a second and everybody may be unmuting yourself in this remote format and um just for a quick second and shouting out a big round of applause to everybody who has contributed and our meeting organizers and um, session leaders and to casey and everyone at iris so thanks everybody for all of your work and for your energy kind of continuing on so um okay and with that we'll kind of get going here so hopefully you can see my, my screen again and um let's see here so one second of course i lost my i lost my view in doing that but um there we go here's here's our here's our fearless leaders and themselves uh one second as i whoops okay so um quickly for the agenda for the day um we're gonna have um kind of a focus on a lot of wrap-up themes in this final session but i think the foundation is going to be a set of um, science presentations where we're here gonna try to hear from a final group of early career scientists who are working on cutting edge marine seismic size science technologies methodologies and who are kind of focused on community building and so we've we've tried to tap into a few of all of you who have can share different aspects of this um, and sort of thinking about you know the current kind of current work that we're doing but also kind of what's going to be the focus um, in the future of, of the marine seismology field um, and then the session is going to kind of transition from there to a quick summary of some of the special interest groups that have happened throughout the last couple of weeks and so we'll get kind of a quick report back from those in case you weren't a part of those individual groups um, and then we'll have we should have some time um, at the end of the session for um, you know kind of an opportunity to share some final thoughts or ask questions of any of the people who have contributed and who, or who are present here um, during in this session. So just kind of stay tuned for that. Um, and so let's see here. I think that um, here um, quickly is a list of the, the science presenters that we'll be hearing from. And so um, we'll be introducing each of these each of these folks individually, and be, they'll be presenting kind of short format talks. So uh, kind of 15 minute. 12, 12 to 15 minute talks um, on various topics. And we should have a little bit of time following each of these for um, a Q&A session. And then again, we've asked everyone to stick around for a little while, kind of when the talk period is over for a little bit more of an open, open discussion on sort of the future of the field. Um, okay, so once again, I think you guys are all familiar with the format from here. So I'll be um, passing off to our first speaker very quickly um, and and then let's see, then we'll follow that up with these SIG reports. So um, with that, I'm going to actually stop sharing here and um, hand it over to Abrea Adams, who Abrea, if you can um, coordinate your own screen there. Excellent. Uh, awesome. Everyone, let's see my screen. 
Yeah, everybody can, can, I can see it perfectly at least, and I can see you. So Abrea is an assistant professor at Colgate University. And as you can, as you can already see, she's going to present, be presenting us um, kind of an overview of the really important topic of, of engaging undergraduates in marine seismic research. I was, I had the, um, a fortunate um, experience of working a little bit with Abrea on the AACSE experiment where she played an important role in a lot of aspects of that, that work, but one of them was um, engaging undergraduates in a really cool experience on Kodiak Island. We might, you know, we might hear a little bit about that today, but with that, I'll hand it over to Abrea. So thanks Abrea for contributing. Excellent. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here and for you all coming to, to hear the talk. Um, so as, as um, we've heard, I am a, a faculty member at Colgate University, which is a primarily undergraduate university. Um, so this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we do a lot of research here at Colgate University, but our research always does have a strong component of engaging undergraduate researchers. And so what I want to talk to you about today is that I think this is something as a community that we should really be paying more attention to as we start to move forward. Uh, because I, I want to actually illustrate to you that we actually don't engage undergraduates in research in the same way that a lot of people in related fields often do. And so I think we're missing out on the opportunity to um, engage students early on and maybe recruit a larger and more diverse population into our field. So. I looked up a few statistics here. So um, I looked up the number of REU research um, experience for undergraduates offered by EAR and OCE in 19, uh, sorry, 2019. And there were 54 of those that were actively being funded. And of those 54, only one was primarily focused on seismology. And that was the large Irish internship program, which is of course a flagship institution um, and very important in our field, um, but is also highly competitive and is specifically targeting upperclassmen. Um, so it's not an opportunity for students to become engaged very early on in their academic careers um, when there's a time period that they may still be able to go and get those physics and mathematics classes that they may not know that they need and so engaging them earlier might be advantageous. Uh, there were three other REUs that did have some form of geophysical research, but not seismic research. And in those three, that was kind of a supplementary part of the program. It wasn't the primary focus of those REUs. And similarly, um, CAC consortium projects, and if you're not familiar with the CAC consortium, it is a group of primarily undergraduate institutions um, that get together and collaborate on research experiences for groups of students, both at the underclassmen level and the upperclassmen level. And for 2014 through 2019, there were 35 of these, and of those 35, only one included seismic research, and that was actually a, a small part of that particular project. So this is something that, compared to many other geoscience fields, we're not doing as much of. And there are a lot of advantages to engaging undergraduate students. So there have been uh, several studies that have shown that Students who participate in research experiences as undergraduates are significantly more likely to persevere and continue on to graduate school than students who express an interest in grad school but do not um, do an undergraduate research experience. And students, especially from underrepresented groups, um, report that after completing a research experience, they feel more confident in their understanding of the science. And I think really critically that they see a broader range of possible careers and um, directions available to them in sciences. So I think it's very important that if we want students to know that this is an option, that seismic research is an option for them, that we start to engage them really early. So with that in mind, I am going to tell you today about some of my experiences um, engaging with undergraduate students in several different ways, particularly around my experiences with the Alaska Amphibious Community Seismic Experiment. So I imagine many of you are familiar with the ACE project, um, but in case you're not, I want to give you just a very brief uh, introduction to some of the scientific goals of that project. Um, the ACE program was designed to investigate the Alaskan subduction system, and in particular, this area of the Alaskan Peninsula and this region here around Kodiak Island as well, uh, where we observe a tremendous amount of variability in features of the subduction zone along strike. Um, 
I could talk about this for the whole 15 minutes, but um, very briefly, the, you know, one of the really big things that we see changing along strike here is that we have the presence of mega thrust earthquakes. We have the 1964 Good Friday earthquake, the second largest recorded earthquake in recorded history, as well as a number of other uh, mega thrust earthquakes. And then right next to those, we have an area where there is a relative seismic gap, where there haven't been mega thrust earthquakes for several hundred years. Um, and GPS evidence suggests that that region is in fact creeping. So one of the questions that we're hoping to address through this project is um, why we see this kind of a long strike variability in the system. So ACE was a community experiment, and we'll come back to that word community in just a little while, but a community experiment that was exclusively data gathering in the uh, initial phase. So there was no funding for analysis originally. Um, and it involved the installation of 105 stations um, on and offshore of the Alaskan Peninsula, uh, connecting up with, it was designed to align with the last year of the um, Alaska TA, so that there could be a very large swath of stations extending all the way through the state and then offshore as well. So this community experiment, one of the reasons it was a community experiment was because of the massive scale of this, um, both in terms of data collection and the logistics of carrying it out. You can see here some of the types of data that were collected on and offshore. Uh, so I mentioned the 105 broadband stations on and offshore. We also had a number of accelerometers and pressure gauges, as well as a nodal array, which I'm gonna come back around to shortly. So part of the reason this was a community experiment was because the scientific goals um, were extremely ambitious and the logistics were pretty complex. So um, part of that community aspect is that we had a pretty large community of PIs. And so here we all are um, naively in the beginning, um, you know, not yet familiar with some of the challenges. Well, anyway, anyway. Um, and, uh, but there's another aspect of this community project, which is that we hope to engage the very broad seismic community, um, thinking kind of challenging what we imagine the edges of that community to be. So we had a lot of workshops. So here's one before we ever collected the data, talking about um, what we, our plans were and where we might be going with this project. But during the data collection, we also engaged with communities like K through 12 teachers. We brought a couple of K through 12 teachers from Anchorage on our data collection cruises, and they designed curricula for um, middle school students uh, based on, on their experiences there. We also brought early and mid-career scientists onto our cruises as well. But what I really want to focus on is um, our work engaging with undergraduates. So we, Engaged with undergraduates in this project in several ways. And, and one of the big ones, which um, Emily alluded to um, when she was introducing me, is a short course that, um, that I designed in Kodiak, Alaska. So this short course um, was a very intensive immersion into seismic research. Um, we advertised nationwide um, for students to apply to this program. We had 54 applications for under, from undergraduate students to participate in the short course um, and only six slots. So I think that, that that speaks to kind of this unmet need of students who are interested in, in getting research experiences um, that are not always available to them. Um, and I will also add that we ended up with uh, also an Iris intern who was working for Lindsay Lowe Worthington that summer as well also joined us. Um, the students that we selected for this, because one of our goals was to broaden the um, accessibility of seismic research to new populations, um, we gave preference to students who had not actually had very much uh, seismic background in their coursework, who may not have geophysical programs at their schools. So many of these students are from small schools without any geophysics faculty members. So they came to Kodiak for a seven full day immersive experience and um, including their travel days. So we started out with a uh, really intense classroom experience where we had a crash course on everything seismology, teaching them kind of seismology 101, as well as more practical skills like how to access the data. Because if we were hoping that some of these students might go back and work with someone to develop maybe a senior thesis, then knowing how to get that data is actually a really critical, um, a really critical aspect. We also taught them about Alaskan tectonics and some techniques that they might use for putting that data to use. 
And um, I want to acknowledge that this classroom um, aspect had a couple of guest leaders, uh, including Dr. Janine Nakai from uh, the University of New Mexico and uh, Connor Droof, who at the time was a PhD student. I'm not sure if he's graduated since at uh, Michigan State. And we followed this up with a really, a really great field trip around Kodiak Island. So we had had a classroom introduction to the tectonics of the system. But then we had a day long field trip where we drove around Kodiak Island. And this was led by Peter Hausler from USGS and Gary Carver, who's retired from Humboldt State and currently lives on Kodiak Island, uh, where we had an opportunity to look at a lot of the features we talked about in our crash course in the classroom, um, but go and see them in the field. But because we didn't want the short course, although we call it a short course, we didn't want it just to be a class that they took for a week over the summer. We also wanted to teach them a little bit about what seismic research might be like. Um, we also engaged them in data collection as well. So this short course was designed to overlap with the end of our nodal array when um, an effort was led by uh, Lindsay Lowe Worthington to deploy 400 nodal seismometers across Kodiak Island. And so when it was time to pick up those nodal seismometers, that's when we scheduled our short course. And the students participated in recovering those nodal seismometers, learning a bit about how sites are selected and how instruments are treated and things of, of, of that nature. So it was really important that they had this field-based component to the experience as well. But I also have, so, so the short course was a way of engaging students from across the US, but um, because I work at a primarily undergraduate institution, I also have some experience engaging my own students and some lessons learned from that experience to share with you. Um, <clears throat> the first of these was during the initial stages of deployment. So I, I led a team to deploy stations on the Alaskan Peninsula and Katmai National Park in summer of 2018. And on that data um, gathering trip, I took with me a Colgate student named Jordan Tockstein, uh, shown here in these pictures. So she was not a senior student at this point in time. She was at that time, she just finished her sophomore year. So she actually graduated a year ago. And she came along for um, this data gathering experience and she did a fabulous job in the field, learned a lot about how instrumentation works, about site selection, considerations for what we want out of seismic data. So I think it was a very useful experience for her. But I felt it was really important and I think it's, it's an important thing to acknowledge that we don't just want to bring students along for data collection. It's really fun for them, I think. Um, but what we really want, if we want them to be researchers in the future, is to see how that data is used. And I think that's an inherent challenge that we have as seismologists, particularly if you're a passive source seismologist, is that it takes a really long time to gather the data. And um, most students, undergraduate students aren't around long enough for that to play out. So I combined this field experience with a lab experience that built on the experience Jordan got with um, instrumentation in the field. And we came back to our university and did a number of experiments on, um, on seismometer performance here at the university itself, uh, in particular comparing raspberry shakes, which uh, market themselves as hobby seismometers, and comparing their performance to like industry standard seismometers, including an STS 2.5. And so that was kind of the scientific aspect of her, um, her experience. And she presented that work later that year at AGU. So data gathering for um, the ACE project has now completed and that data is now available. And the initial funding was exclusively for data collection, but I now have a separately funded project to do data analysis and engagement with undergraduates is also an important portion of this um, new research moving forward. So I'll briefly tell you about the scientific goals of that research. Um, uh, my plans are to use surface wave tomography using the two plane wave method, which some of you may be familiar with, to look at the structure of the Alaskan Peninsula. And in particular, to use both Rayleigh and Love waves to create models of um, SV and SH shear wave velocities. And the goal of this is to look at the ratios of SV and SH velocities to try and tell whether we have type A anisotropy, which is the type of anisotropy we typically interpret um, as methyl anisotropy as, or if we have type B anisotropy, which is associated with uh, hydrous minerals. And so if we are able to distinguish between the two, then we should be able to tell, um, to, to map out hydration in the mantle wedge. 
So in this project, um, I was supposed to begin it last summer, and so I was supposed to have a team of three undergraduates who are working on this research last summer um, and starting to process some of the data. Um, COVID intervened, of course, and so that summer research experience didn't quite happen as intended, but um, I did work with the students remotely on skill building workshops, which they were all eager to do, learning to code and learning to do some basic processing of seismic data. And of those three students who worked with me last summer, one is retained and is going to work with me again this summer. Um, one has graduated and is gonna teach for a couple of years, but intends to go to grad school. And one of them is um, doing a different kind of research now. So I guess they didn't like, um, like the seismic data. But um, this summer I have a larger group of students coming in. I have four undergraduate students. And I wanna point out that these four undergraduate students are at a range of levels. I have two current freshmen, one current sophomore and one current junior. So it's a whole range of students. And it's my hope that I can capture some of those underclassmen who may find this interesting and persuade them that they should then go and take the full line of calculus and the full line of physics uh, so that they can continue to do this kind of work. Um, I also have a postdoc who is joining this project this summer as well, and it's in the process of being made 100% official, but he's on this call and told me I could tell you. So uh, Christo Ramirez will be joining me as a postdoc um, in a couple of months to work on this project. And that is a, a, a postdoctoral project that has a major research component, but it also has a secondary focus on working with undergraduates, both in research and also in teaching geophysics at an undergraduate level. So I hope this has given you some ideas on how you might be able to engage undergraduates in your research programs and, and why you should, um, so that we can hopefully um, broaden some of the, the um, some of the groups of people who see this as a possibility for their future careers. So that's it. If I have time for questions, I'm happy to take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Afraya. That was that was excellent overview of a lot of different things to ways of engaging to kind of the next generation of, of marine seismologists and regular seismologists too. But um, I think there is definitely time for questions. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question, please feel free to, you know, do the raise hand thing or which will put you to the top of the list. Or if, if you don't hear anybody speaking, I think it's okay also to unmute yourself. However, I do see a question from Michael Brunt right now. If you'd like to go ahead, Michael. Yes, thank you. First and foremost, I want to applaud you on what you were doing. Okay, um, I think it's great. And this has actually been my endeavor for the last, you know, 12, 13 years. However, you know, being a uh, high school teacher, um, you know, my goal has been trying to reach them when they're at that point where they're, they're initially making their career decisions. And um, many of them, many of them at that time, sitting on the fence is to, is to decide as to which direction they want to go, and, and that's where I, I heard you mention about you know putting you know you involve K through 12 teachers, you know, and I thought that was you know a really great idea because that was that's my main focus is that you know I, you know also hitting the undergraduate chat, but reaching further back into into the classrooms, you know, into the high school classrooms where you have many of those students at that time that are truly a lot of them. I can guarantee you it's a lot of them that are un, really unsure, you know, where the direction they want to go. Most of them that are confident in the direction they want to go, it's because their parents are putting, leading them in that direction. And um, so, you know, and that's what I've been doing. And that's the thing that I wanted to, you know, to bring up is, you know, the possibility of putting K through 12 teachers into the classrooms. I mean, I've done it before uh, during the research. Um, I've uplinked directly to classrooms, talked to students directly in the classrooms while I was on the ship, while I was part of the research. So they're, they're actually seeing what they're, what's going on. And then also at the same time, a creative curriculum, which is, you know, very important. But, you know, that that's, you know, I, I've really like to discuss with you later about that possibility of, you know, and, and anybody else out there about including, you know, uh, teachers in the classroom is uh, education specialist on a lot of this research to reach these students that are in the school still sitting there undecided as to how they want to go, or maybe some that are really close on the fence, pushing, pushing more in that direction. Because one of the things that I experienced was 
I came to Thailand in April 2017. The first response I got to students when I put my seismographs in the classroom is, Thailand don't have earthquakes. There's no earthquakes in Thailand. And then sure enough, the greatest thing that ever happened was just the following year, there were two fairly good sized five and six earthquakes, you know, right on the Thai Lao border, you know, and, and the northern part of Thailand is very seismic active. Sure, they have, you know, lower twos and threes and stuff like that. But, you know, and it opened their eyes at that point in time. They're like, oh, wait a minute. And then even, even more so, much of the generation that we're dealing with, the younger generations, the students in the high school, they weren't here when the uh, Sumatra tsunami happened, you know, or they were very, very young, you know, when the, uh, when the uh, Japan earthquake occurred. So when I brought those up in the class, they, they were, their minds were blank. They, they, they had no idea about it, you know, about those huge events. And, and that actually created a pretty difficult hurdle to get over, you know, and, and especially even more so being here in Thailand, um, when I had to show them the video of the tsunami and how, I mean, Thailand was devastated, you know, by that. And yet they had zero knowledge of that. And, and to me, that was really heartbreaking, but yet something that I thought was, how could they not know? you know, and that was disheartening to me. And, and I think, you know, going even back further and reaching into the, those classrooms, whether it be at the middle school or the high school level is, is also critical to capturing them. The soon as we can capture them, the better it is. Um, Michael, and thanks I, for that comment. I'm gonna, that we see a couple other questions coming in. To I'm sorry, I can go on and on and on. Please. Interrupt you, yeah, but no, thanks for that feedback. Um, one other maybe quick question before we move on here, I'm seeing in the chat from Ansel. Um, Anne, do you want to ask it directly to everybody? Or I, I'd be happy to read. If I don't hear from you, I'll be happy to read it. Yeah, sure. I can I can read it. Um, <laughs> so, Abreda, what was the main feedback that you got from the students you wrote in Alaska? And are you still in touch with them or are they still uh, in touch with each other? And did some of them, um, did the short course inspire them to do research in seismology? So that's a great question. And I don't have a great answer for you. Um, we did stay in contact off and on for probably about a, a year afterwards. Um, the students may have stayed in contact a little bit longer. Um, I did hear from some of the faculty advisors of the students that they, they found it very useful, but I'm afraid I haven't done a longitudinal follow-up. So perhaps I should. Thanks. All about Justin, it looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, I'll go real quick. Um, Abrea, that was awesome. Thank you for this presentation. I have a question. This is something I'm like, I think about for future directions. And it's like, could you like talk about like the selection process or the criteria? You like, it sounded like it was way over applied for, right? There's a huge need. Mm -hmm. But then like you end up with this paradox in the selection process of like, the best resumes are often the students that have been the most uh, enabled, right? So it's almost like a self-reinforcing system where the best resume is the one that had the most access to resources to begin with. So how did you kind of like build equity or how do you suggest build building equity into like future like calls for or selection criteria? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think that for the short course, it is important to note that that was um, intended to be an introduction to seismology. So um, although we did get a lot of applications from students who would have been extremely qualified for a, a very advanced um, research experience. You know, they had like some three or four classes in geophysics as an undergrad, which is amazing. Um, you know, for that particular course, we were looking for people who, who needed an introduction. And so, you know, that was one of our selection criteria. Um, but we were looking for people who had expressed an interest, both in terms of their written material and in terms of the courses they had chosen of what was available to them. So if they were at a school that did not have a geophysics program, but they had taken some classes in calculus and physics, you know, that indicates an interest in this area, but they've not yet learned about how that might apply to, to geophysics. Um, I think also within our own programs, so, so research programs we might have within a university, 
there can be different goals for different levels. So if you have a graduate student or you know maybe an upper level undergraduate student, you do need someone who has enough skill set to kind of hit the ground running if they're an undergraduate for their own sake because they're not going to be around very long. But this is where it can be really useful to also start to recruit more underclassmen as well because at that point um, they still have a time to develop those skills. Um, and to go out and seek out those courses in, in mathematics and physics that they would need to be successful in their future careers. And so there, I think, looking for drive, looking for interest, looking for really thoughtful questions. One of my students who's working with me this coming summer asked me about the social impact of this project, which I thought was great. Um, no one had asked me about that before. Um, I think it's also worth noting that I pitched this differently to upperclassmen and underclassmen. So upperclassmen, um, you know, I really pitched kind of the, the excitement of the scientific questions. And I think that seems to really resonate with them. But when you're talking about underclassmen, many of them are very um, uncertain about what direction they want to go. And especially many students coming from um, uh, underrepresented groups are really needing to make sure they can get a job afterwards. And um, so talking about skills to underclassmen, I find to be particularly useful for uh, recruitment. And we have a lot of skills that are broadly applicable in seismology. We don't deal with big data, computation, they learn to code and all sorts of things that, you know, we can convince them pretty easily are very marketable <laughs> skills. And so I think that's an important aspect too. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Abraya and everyone. I um, this is a this is a really important discussion, I think. And so hopefully, maybe we can continue this um, at the very end of the session. I, I know I have more questions for Abraya, but I'll I'll save those um, maybe for the end. Um, and so for now, though, I think we'll we'll go ahead and move on to our, our next presenter. Thanks again, Abraya, for that great um, great. Uh, summary of your work. Um, next, we're going to hear from Jared Klusner. Um, Jared, if you want to go ahead, if you're here and you want to go ahead and initiate your screen share, perfect. I think I, we can see your slides and you can go ahead and um, start, the present, or start the presentation if you want to. Um, so Jared is a research geophysicist at the USGS Pacific Coastal and Marine Science Center. And I think we're going to be hearing today um, from some of his work looking at sort of 3D se seismic attributes from the Santa Barbara channel. So I'll hand it over to you, Jared. Thanks very much for sharing with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks for putting me in the early career group. I'm on the, I'm on the fringe. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in the Santa Barbara channel, looking at um, what are some of the controls on slope failure there. And one thing I wanted to point out is that this is using publicly available data. Both of these 3D seismic volumes are available for download on NAMS. So um, this is kind of a good example of what's out there, that data that we can use to, to try to do some research on that doesn't require a cruise, for instance. Um, and also to mention that a lot of the structural part of this talk has been published. It came out in late 2020. So for the folks that are interested in that, um, check it out. Yeah, it's, uh, before I start, um, get some shout outs to folks involved in this. Danny Brothers, who's at the USGS along with me and as far as in the hazards project. Alexis Wright, who's now a PhD student at Colorado School of Mines, did some early work on this project. And then Sam Johnson, who is emeritus, but is still very active. A little background, the, for those that don't know, the Santa Barbara Channel is uh, part of the West Northwest Trending Pacific North American transport plate boundary. Um, and so this box here kind of gives you an idea of where it's located along that boundary. It's part of the Western Transverse Ranges crustal block. And this is a block that trends east-west and is currently undergoing north-south compression. And this sets it apart from the strike slip regime that is seen in the south and into the north. Um, and the channel itself, the offshore component, actually makes up the leading edge of this fold and thrust belt that formed about two or three million years ago. It's undergoing active shortening within the basin, and it's, as you can see, a very seismically active area. Um, there's some bathymetry in the, in, the, in the channel itself, and uh, I wanted to point out the, the yellow is highlighting the uh, submarine landslides that are located here. And in particular, I'm gonna focus on the area in this red box because that's where we have 3D seismic data available. 
um, because of the uh, petroleum um, um, as, um, potential here in the basin. And I'm be focusing on the Goleta landslide complex, which is this larger one, and then the smaller one, the Gaviota. And the main feature in this area that I'm going to talk about is this NPF. It's the North Channel PS point. This is the blind thrust fault. And I'll refer to this as the North Channel fault for most of the talk. Here's a zoom in of that area of the detailed bathymetry. This is some that we, in the green that we collected a few years ago. And you can see here's the Western part of the landslide complex and uh, Gaviota. And interesting, there's these seafloor fissure zones on the seafloor as well that folks have interpreted as incipient failure. Um, here's the location of the two petroleum platforms. So there's abundant offshore infrastructure out here as far as hazards go. And there's a number of um, seafloor features in this area that indicated it fluid flow, um, a number of pockmarks, um, for instance. It's a map that shows the data coverage. The, the red uh, outlines show the two 3D seismic volumes that are located here. And then the black lines show all the high res um, 2D seismic that we've collected over um, the past five years or so. A little bit of methods. Uh, a lot of the horizon mapping done in the uh, seismic data was using something called dip steering, which allows us to calculate basically the dip and the azimuth of all the seismic events. And it makes mapping these horizons uh, a lot more um, efficient um, in these data volumes. And then we also, I also use the combination of other attributes such as similarity or also known as coherency and something called thin fault likelihood that was developed by um, Hale out of Colorado School of Mines to you know, try to lessen the user bias on, on the fault mapping itself. And so this is an example of, for instance, the thin fault likelihood approach algorithm where it's done a nice job highlighting these splay faults that come off the, the master thrust to death. Um, fluid pathways, <clears throat> I refer to as chimney zones in, in this study. And we, I used a supervised neural network approach to generate a chimney meta attribute. And what this does is it takes a number of seismic attributes that are known to highlight specific geological features in the data, be that gas or salt, for instance. You combine that with the interpreter's knowledge, put it into an artificial neural network, and then your output that you get is what we call a meta attribute, um, a volume of information that basically scales and in, for instance from like zero to one probability of how probable is it that that seismic um, trace represents the geologic feature that you're going after and so this is a 3d rendering for instance of the area around the harmony platform showing probable fluid migration pathways in the blue and yellow um, above the reservoir monterey formation at depth um, <clears throat> so this is a map view of mapping in the two 3D seismic volumes. This is the horizon called the Repetto formation. And this is located right above the reservoir rock. And this does a good job showing kind of the broad structure across the region. The yellow outlines show the location of the landslides above on the seafloor. So you can hear there's the landslide complex, the big one. Here's the seafloor fissures and Gaviota. And what we see is that there's this nice, um, these nice anaclines and deformation associated with the North Channel system, which I, I highlight with this dashed line here. Um, you can see that there's some localized uplift um, on this landslide, and there's substantial uplift um, just upslope of the headscarp of the landslide complex. The thin, line, the thin black lines are the, the uh, thin fault likelihood projected on top of that. So if we remove the topography and then bring in the, uh, the neural net results from the chimney and use transparencies to overlay multiple attributes, what we can see is that there's a strong correlation between what appears to be fluid migration along the fault zone, and in particularly this north channel system highlighted with the dashed line. And if we look at an example of inline 1670, you can see here we have the thin fault likelihood attribute results in black and in the green and yellow are the chimney results. And there's a nice agreement between the two. And in this feature here actually reaches up to the seafloor with high probabilities. And this is an area where we see a pockmark on the seafloor. We move to the east and go across Gaviota landslide. We see similar results um, focused along display faults, high chimney probabilities, um, and what's interesting is this is bounding a, an uplifted block that's located directly underneath the Gaviota headscarp of, of the landslide. And something else to note is that 
you also notice there's reverse polarity high amplitude reflections that basically uh, are just up dip of this fault zone and their amplitudes terminate against it, suggesting that fluids and, and gas are, are coming up the fault zone and then uh, prop migrating up dip along these beds, probably um, sandy beds. Uh, further to the east, we see a similar pattern as we get closer to the Goleta landslide head scarp. In this case, a chimney zone reaches the seafloor. This is actually where we imaged a large seep field in the water column data. And then <clears throat> and a line through the Goleta landslide head scarp. And this is this 3D seismic volume is, is not as high as quality, but it shows kind of the similar pattern of uh, uh, a lot of splay faulting happening and uh, fluids. Uh, or chimney zones, and this is located directly below the head scarp of the uh, landslide complex. This is a perspective view, kind of putting it all together. The gray is the seafloor. Um, here we've cut away some inlines and cross lines. Here's that repetal horizon at depth, and you can see as we move to the east, you get this ramping up of uplift associated with the uh, thrust faulting and splays. And the red, the thick red is the uh, location of the head scarp of the Goleta and, and the Gaviota. Now, and something I wanted to point out here is if you look at this pink purplish horizon that's mapped between the two seismic volumes, this represents the, the base of the last interglacial. And I'm gonna show this in map view on the next slide so that we can get a, a better understanding of what this looks like uh, as far as like quaternary deformation. So this panel A, it shows the relief along that mapped horizon. Uh, again, I've shown the location of the landslides with the yellow. And then what's interesting is that you can see there are these uh, black lines which represent the shallow structures. This is the shallow splay faulting associated with the deformation zone. Um, it forms an N echelon pattern. It has this interesting counterclockwise rotation in the strike. And it also has these kind of punctuated uplift zones in between the N echelon steps, with one of them located directly below um, the caveat landslide. The second panel B just highlights how similarity and coherency can help highlight these features. You can see there are these white lineaments that pop up in this horizon, and those are the display faults. And then we can also do um, isopac calculations to see how deposition during the quaternary has has happened um, since the, this last interglacial. And I want to point out this kind of narrow band of white, which represents where sediments are rapidly thinning. And this coincides with some paleo slides that we see in the data, um, the fault system, and the gaviota uplift, the slides, the fissure. And then it, it leads up to the western edge of the Glee landslide uh, scarp where it, it drops down because that quaternary sediment has failed in, in this system. So there's a really close uh, co correlation between, between these patterns. We can then project the, the fluid, uh, the chimney, the neural net results onto this horizon to see what kind of patterns we see in the shallow subsurface. And although it's not as tied directly to the faulting as what we see at depth, we still see indications along these splay faults, concentrations along the uplifted blocks between the steps and the splays. And as we move further to the east, closer to the larger landslide complex, it becomes much more widespread and uh, closer to the actual shelf break. And as I mentioned before, this zone here, where it's located one of the splay faults, we actually imaged a pretty big seep field. This is about 400 meters across. Um, active seepage. We also have uh, a dense uh, 2D, high-res 2D, which allows us to connect those kind of lower resolution op uh, observations from the 3D seismic data right up to the seafloor with this high-res component. So one of those chimney zones that I said reached the pockmark, this is what it looks like in the high-res. It's within an anticline zone. You get this nice blanking zone that comes up right underneath the pockmark. There's indications of shallow gas movement within the sediment up dip as well. You go across the Gaviota landslide, you can see we've got great imaging and age control on the faults themselves. And we can see that there are these um, reverse polarity reflections. It, there's no polarity on this plot, but this is an actual reverse polarity reflection that amplitude increases up dip and then abruptly stops right directly below um, the head scarp of Gaviota. So, Combining all this together, what we think is happening is that we've got an updip fluid migration along um, gas and fluid charred beds. 
you have this rapid zone of thinning that occurs above this tectonically uplifted spot along this uh, deformation, deformation trend. And you also have abundant fluids coming up this play fault system. And we think that all this is essentially combining to uh, and delivering fluids to shallow sediments, resulting in and reduced shear strength along um, this section of the slope. So in conclusion, we use an integrated suite of 2D and 3D geophysical data to look at what are the controls on where um, slope failure is occurring in the Santa Barbara Channel. And what we reveal is that uh, there's an intricate splay faulting pattern that uh, forms an N echelon with localized uplift um, that leads to um, uplift and thinning of this quaternary strata. This deformation zone is uh, spatially correlated with the east-west trending seafloor fissures and head headlight and <clears throat> landslide headscarps. And so we think there's a direct relationship between the slope failure and a long strike variations in the tectonostratigraphic framework. Bringing in the neural net chimney attributes blended with the faults and along the horizons allows us to look at these fault fluid path relationships. Um, the fluid pathways are focused along the deformation zone at depth, and in the shallow subsurface, they terminate in the shallow reverse polarity bright spots, and in some instances, actually reach the seafloor underneath pockmarks and seat fields. Um, these chimney zones are also located spatially along where the landslide and seafloor fissure zones are, and then so what we think is that structural patterns and the fluid migration um, combined along this deformation trend is setting up a situation of reduced shear strength and slope failure along this deformation trend. And also to mention is that we think that this also is an area that's effectively preconditioned for future failure um, and during, for instance, future earthquakes. So I'll leave it at that. Take any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Jared. Um, all right, folks, maybe time for one or two quick questions here. Um, I see already a hand from Wenyan, and also feel free, you guys, to enter questions in the chat. Okay, hey, great. Um, excellent talk. Thank you, Jared. Um, as you mentioned, this is preconditioned for future feeders, and I imagine you have some dating of the past feeders. So what's your wildest guess, when or where do we expect the next one? Uh, well, it might, as far as um, where, I would say that probably on the western edge of the Goleta where we see that active seat field um, is a good spot. It's along a splay fault there. It's, it's also where the, you get this increased slope gradient. Um, as far as when, that's a trickier question. I would say when there's a next now magnitude five plus and it depends on where that's located if it's actually located along the north channel shaking that's involved with that so as far as the wind goes um gaviota is thought the smaller landslide was thought to have failed within the last 100 to 600 years so it, it's a fairly recent slide um, the galita landslide complex has been failing um, multiple times um, uh, over a long period of time um, so the, the win, I, I can't say. <laughs> so do you expect, a, a quick follow-up, um, do you expect any other Southern California earthquakes, not necessarily on this fault, would, uh, would, would facilitate or promote failures in this region? I would suspect that the shaking is, is great enough in this area, then yeah. Not necessarily along the fault. But... And it's an important area. I mean, there's a lot of infrastructure out there, as you could tell from the petroleum perspective. It's kind of surprising to look that they actually put the platforms right there, but when they installed them, they did not have the bathymetry and they didn't know that the landslides were necessarily there at the time. I know, it's wild. Um, thank you. Yep. All right, folks, um, any other questions for Jared? I might have a quick one if there's time and then move on. But um, Jared, I was just curious, and I, I think you could probably kind of showed this in your presentation, but I was just going to kind of ask for a little clarification. So the um, with the, the 3D data set and sort of the, the meta attribute analysis that you're posing, do you, do you feel like, um, you know, that has informed 
this as any type of a similar strategy for two for two D data? Could this work with two D data the way that you've applied it to a three D data set? I, it, or is it um, is it yeah. just a simpler problem in two D? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we, we've actually applied it to 2D data. We have a couple papers, uh, one that was just published on the Queen Charlotte Fault, where we, we do a, a similar analysis. We published one on the East Coast as well, where we, we use this approach. It's not as robust because you're obviously working only in two dimensions. And so you can't use a lot of the attributes that, you know, are doing similarity calculations in the 3D plane, not just in a, a 2D space. So... Uh, but it, it still can be done on, on 2D analysis, on 2D data. Oh, yes, of course. Um, all right. Well, once again, you guys, there, there, there should be more time for discussion um, as we move into the um, kind of end of the session here. So hold, hold any extra questions you come up with um, for that portion. And I'll, I we kind of transitioned quickly here, but I'm just gonna, for those who've joined the session um, recently, I'm just gonna mention again that we're, we're hearing from kind of a diverse group of, of scientists here in this, in this short talk format that are representing really a broad range of kind of new technologies or community engaging efforts. And so we've already heard from Abrea and, and Jared kind of representing different sides of the spectrum. Um, and now we're going to transition to um, a talk by Hannah Mark. So Hannah, if you don't mind starting um, to share while I introduce you here, Hannah is a um, is the Fawcett postdoctoral, postdoctoral fellow at Washington University in St. Louis. And Hannah, um, along these lines, is going to show us kind of a different science presentation focused on anisotropy, I think, in the oceanic lithosphere. So thinking about a whole other sort of scale of science problem in this case. Um, and so I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Hannah. Thanks very much for, for sharing with us today. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you to the organizers of this meeting for really putting on the, the gold standard of virtual meetings, um, in my opinion. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak in this session. So the work I'm gonna be talking about today was done, I'll first of all say with, with a whole bunch of people whose names are listed here. I hope I didn't forget anybody, but um, that's, that's a good start. And so I'm talking today, like Emily just said, about anisotropy in oceanic lithosphere, in the lithospheric mantle. And I wanna specify um, before I really dive in that I'm talking about azimuthal anisotropy in like the couple of kilometers below the MOHO. So this is a kind of local measurement that we make with active source refraction data. Um, this isn't global, this isn't um, fancy or 3D. And in fact, it's the kind of measurement that we tend to parameterize in terms of, you know, we come up with a model for velocity variation with azimuth. So north, south, east, west, we're looking in a horizontal plane and that azimuthal dimension is our, is our one dimension. Um, and what I'm gonna present to you today are sort of two different projects that I have, have worked on or, or am working on, where we try and move a little bit past um, that sort of DV of theta picture and see what else we can learn from active source refraction measurements of azimuthal anisotropy. Um, and just so you know, the background of this slide is actually some data um, from the Marianas Trench. It's the only data I'm gonna show you, so um, feast your eyes on that. But moving on, I think it's useful to start um, with the sort of the, the basic thing that we maybe want to do with azimuthal anisotropy, um, and that is use it as a proxy for mantle flow. Um, and I think this figure from Skemmer and Hansen 2016 illustrates really nicely the sort of geophysical inference loop that we'd like to travel around, where we measure the magnitude and orientation of seismic anisotropy in some place like the oceanic upper mantle. We connect that to the development of a crystal preferred orientation or a lattice preferred orientation, or I'll usually say a mineral fabric, um, which we typically assume is uh, formed as a result of shear strain, shear deformation in olivine. Um, that can be connected via laboratory experiments to actual rock deformation um, with, with physical materials as opposed to just uh, wiggles on your screen. And then eventually we, we track that back to hopefully some larger scale picture of, of where the mantle is going with lots of pretty arrows on a figure. Um, but I, I put the word peril in the title of this slide for a reason. Um, and the reason for that is that as with so many things um, in the earth, it's, it's not that simple. Um, seismic data being highly non-unique in many ways. Um, one complication with interpreting azimuthal anisotropy in terms of, of olivine fabric and mantle flow is that there's not just one kind of olivine fabric, as I'm sure many of you are aware, 
Um, and as I've already mentioned, we tend to interpret azimuthal anisotropy in the oceanic mantle as being a type fabric. Um, but in this diagram from Carato et al. 2008, it's showing you that depending on your stress and water content conditions, when you're deforming your olivine, you can end up with different um, predominant slip systems in olivine that will give you different types of fabric. When we measure azimuthal anisotropy using active source refraction data, as I said, we're looking sort of in the horizontal plane. We're not getting necessarily the full pole figure picture that we would need to be able to distinguish between these types. Um, another complication in these anisotropy measurements is that mineral fabric isn't the only source of anisotropy we have to worry about. Um, this exceedingly simple cartoon that I drew for you all is illustrating the fact that um, thin layers, and thin is, is relative to a seismic wavelength, also look anisotropic. So if you have a whole bunch of aligned faults, joints, cracks, if you have um, thin compositional layering, for example, from sheared melt or a shape preferred orientation of melt, um, all of that will also look anisotropic in the data that we collect. Um, and so I typically refer to mineral fabric type anisotropy as being intrinsic in some sense and these, these more structural forms as being extrinsic. And we have to deal with both of them somehow, right? Um, so, where this, where this brings us, or at least where it brings me, and I hope I'm taking you along, is that azimuthal anisotropy is not always, and maybe even not usually, um, just telling us about simple mid-ocean ridge-derived mineral fabric that's the result of like plate spreading in some nearly 2D sense. And to illustrate that, I'm showing you this map. Um, I made this in 2017, it probably needs an update, but I tried to pull as many um, references from the literature that I could find where people had done these local measurements of azimuthal anisotropy in the oceanic upper mantle using active source refraction. And for each experiment, I've plotted these red wedges um, where the size of the wedge illustrates the angular difference between the paleo spreading direction when that piece of the plate was formed and the fast direction measured by azimuthal anisotropy. So if we assumed that azimuthal anisotropy really represented sort of 2D mantle flow beneath a mid-ocean ridge, um, we should expect that the paleo spreading direction and the fast direction would be aligned um, under those conditions, these should be horizontal lines everywhere. Um, and they're not, which is uh, maybe frustrating, but, but maybe very exciting. Um, and so the question that, um, that I'm trying to address in some of my research is how do we separate the pieces of these signals into the mineral fabric components and the more extrinsic or structural components so that we can learn something about the earth from both of them because they're telling us different things, um, but, but both perhaps useful things. So today I have two case studies for you from different places in the Pacific um, that represent ways of trying to separate these intrinsic and extrinsic components of azimuthal anisotropy. And the first one, um, I've, I've given away the story in the title of this slide, but it's a case where we are looking at mainly intrinsic or mineral fabric anisotropy. Um, we are looking here at a map of the no-melt experiment, which if you saw Jim Garrity's poster earlier in the symposium, you probably already know a lot about. But we're here um, in the Central Pacific on a piece of 70 million year old ish uh, minimally altered oceanic lithosphere. And so the, the overall goal of NOMEL, right, was to get a picture of the lithosphere asthenosphere system here um, in the hopes of, of elucidating something you might call the, the basic structure of a normal plate with, with heavy air quotes around the word normal. Um, but so the part I'm talking about today is azimuthal and isotropy measured from this data set. We had an array of broadband OBSs as well as short periods and labeled on this map are three active source refraction lines, including this nice curved one here, which was especially useful for measuring anisotropy in here. I just again want to emphasize that we're not close to a trench, we're not close to a ridge, we're not close to a hotspot, we're just kind of in the middle of, of nowhere in a stable spreading segment looking at what the upper mantle um, is like. And to skip all of um, the methodology and the data wrangling, this is what we get. Um, so on the right side of this slide, I'm showing you velocity variation as a function of azimuth, that sort of 1D anisotropy picture. Each of the points on this graph represents a single travel time pick of a mantle refraction. Um, and basically what this model has in it is 6% um, peak to peak variation in P wave velocity around a mean of about 8.1 kilometers per second. So a pretty standard upper mantle velocity. Um, the fast azimuth here is right around 83 degrees north, um, which, is, which is great because the fossil spreading direction at the no-melt site is actually about 82 north. So um, again, consistent with, with our goal for no-melt of looking at some kind of normal or basic plate structure, this really does match our expectations for an intrinsic source of anisotropy, a mineral fabric formed by 2D mid-ocean ridge processes. But um, 
when I say mainly intrinsic anisotropy, that maybe is a hint that it's not the whole story. Um, and that is because our best model to explain these data actually includes anisotropic vertical velocity gradients. Um, so we found that the best way to explain our observations was to include um, a slight increase in velocity in the fast direction and none in the slow direction. Again, this is very shallow. So sort of the, the resolution extent of our model is seven kilometers below the MOHO, which to many of you is like, like nothing. Um, but the point that I wanna make here is that what we end up with in the end is velocity variation that is a function of azimuth, but also of depth. Um, so that's adding a little more than one dimension to our model here. And we interpreted this as um, showing us again, this, this mineral fabric component that is maybe more intrinsic um, and some extrinsic component that comes in in the depth variation, which we interpreted as potentially aligned cracks, maybe from um, sort of thermal contraction of the plate that close within the upper few kilometers of the mantle as pressure increases. And if you wanna read any more about this, you can check out our 2019 paper. Um, but I have another case study to get to. So we're gonna move on to part two here, which is um, in a totally different location. So we're adding some faults to this picture. And to do that, we're going to the Central Marianas Trench. That's what this map is showing. It's location um, of a 2012 seismic experiment. I've plotted on this map a bunch of broadband and short period OBS along with more hydrophones. This isn't all the instruments in the experiment, it's just the ones that I happen to be using for this project. Um, and the black lines are again, active source lines. So this is a totally different place than the no-melt site, right? This is um, a subduction zone where we have a plate that is bending into a trench. Um, the top of the plate under extension as it bends is faulting. And these faults are basically acting as porous pathways for water to seep all the way down into the slab mantle. So what we're trying to do um, in this particular project is use seismic anisotropy to actually study those faults. And you can see some of the scarps on the seafloor that are roughly trench parallel. Um, so we're gonna use azimuth anisotropy to look at these faults and then hopefully be able to connect that back to hydration of the slab mantle. Um, so again, skipping over a whole bunch of, of intermediate steps, this is sort of where we are right now, or at least the first part of it. This is another of these DV versus azimuth plots for you with each point again being a single mantle refraction pick. Um, I'm just showing you briefly the data coverage. This is a 10% random sample of all the source receiver pairs that I'm using. So you can see our data coverage near the trench isn't maybe quite as good as um, one would like, but you know, water depth is a factor there um, along with the ray geometry, but we have pretty good coverage. Um, one thing you might notice is that this curve is not nearly as beautiful as the one from no melt. The points do not cooperate and lie perfectly along that red line. Um, so let's actually try and break it down a little bit and see what that might mean. Um, to do that, I'm going to separate all of our data into three sort of spatial bins by longitude. You can see that this dark blue bin outlined is closest to the trench and the yellow one is farthest from the trench. If we take our data and subdivide it spatially and fit for anisotropy in each of these three regions, um, here I'm showing what we get when we do that. So these are again DV versus azimuth, only over 180 degrees this time. The top is nearest the trench, the bottom is farthest from the trench, and just the, the basic observation to make here is that they all look um, kind of different from one another, particularly the far from trench is different from the other two. It's maybe a little easier to see what's going on if I plot them against each other and add the isotropic background back in. Um, so the, the key observation that we've made so far here is that um, in this yellow curve, which is anisotropy farthest from the trench, um, the fast direction is roughly at 120 degrees north, which is more or less parallel to the fossil spreading direction here. As we go closer to the trench, that fast direction rotates significantly. And by the time we get to the closest bin, um, it's actually around 155, 160 degrees north, which is roughly parallel to the strike of those faults we see on the seafloor, um, parallel to the trench axis. So here we have another case where we have our velocity variation with azimuth, but we've added in another sort of slight dimension to this problem, which is that anisotropy also varies with distance from the trench. And the interpretation here, right, is that we see mineral fabric that as we approach the trench is being overprinted by the signal from these aligned bend faults. Um, and so where we're hoping to go with this, and this is um, ongoing work, um, is that we have also from this same Marianas experiment, a bunch of really great tomography results. This is um, a refraction model for Melody Imer's thesis work showing VP along a cross section um, through the trench. And this is some work by Chen Tsai. It's a surface wave model. So we have VSV again through the trench. These aren't quite the same transect, but they're very close to each other. And in both models, um, you can see a velocity reduction in the uppermost mantle, just sort of around the bend of the incoming plate 
as it subducts. And so that's interpreted in both cases as representing serpentinization of the slab mantle. And what we're hoping to do with this anisotropy study is, you know, be able to add some detail that the tomography models can't see. Um, and I've envisioned this in this sort of cartoon overlay as really looking at these faults, trying to understand what we can about them so that we can consider what the effect on sort of the total volume or flux of water in this setting is, if all that water is, you know, most likely confined to a whole bunch of fault surfaces as opposed to a sort of an amorphous um, tomography-ish blob, um, and what that has to do with the deep water cycle at Marianas. Um, so to wrap up here, I guess the point that I'm hoping to make with this short talk is that anisotropy um, is complicated, but it's useful that it is complicated. We like that it is complicated because it means we have an opportunity to learn about a whole lot of things um, from rich processes and mental flow through to aligned structures and then even what those aligned structures mean for larger scale earth processes like subduction water cycling. Um, and I think what I've found in, in doing this work is that picking apart these sources of anisotropy requires looking at velocity variation with at least a little more than just azimuth. Um, and we have the ability to do that with some data sets that exist. And it's something to think about for collecting this kind of data in the future if people want to do these kinds of analyses. So I'll stop there and take any questions. Thanks so much, Hannah. Fabulous talk. Um, any questions for, for Hannah? Feel free to pop them in the chat or raise your hand. Actually, I have a question while they're thinking about it. Um, it it's really cool to see your, these two um, anisotropy studies from two very different settings. And they're also two quite different looking experimental designs. And so I was curious what recommendations you would make for future studies to really optimize for future active source studies of anisotropy, what recommendations you would make to kind of optimize our ability to characterize it? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I think um, for NOMELT, it was obviously really great that we had that semicircular line with a radius of about 75 kilometers um, around the center of the array. That helped a lot with getting good azimuthal coverage. Um, that said, if you want to be able to look at depth variation, you're gonna need also like range variation. Um, so, I mean, if I were to design my ideal experiment, maybe I would have it look something like a, a bullseye with a whole bunch of different rings. That might be kind of difficult. Um, and it also doesn't make it easy for if you want to collect like co-located MCS, then the geometry would be an, a nightmare. But um, maybe maybe boxes <laughs> would be better. Um, I don't know. But you want to consider both um, getting full 360 degree azimuthal coverage. And also if you want to look at these spatial variations, you know, not only doing one one circle around the center. Great, thanks. I'm sure the uh, the team on the Langseth would love you if you wanted to shoot a bunch of circles. <laughs> um, Colton Leonard has a question. Can I disagree up front? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, really cool results. Um, in the Marianas cases, the modeled anisotropy didn't look like a nice, you know, sine wave, mm -hmm. uh, especially for the closer bins. So is there like added complexity to that that you're trying to pull out of it? Or is that just like a best fit weird wiggle? Or how, how do you go from something that's like a nice curve in bin two to the sort of kinks that you have in the closer bins? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, I didn't feel like I had time to really dive into it, but that's a very important part of this work. Um, so I know that you do a lot of stuff with an isotropy, so you probably already have got some ideas in your head right now. When I look at that curve, I say, hmm, is there a four theta signal? Um, we are including a four theta term in the fit, which is why it even looks like that. Um, so for those who don't think about this in, in maybe quite as much detail all the time, um, the four theta term in the sort of standard fit for a a velocity curve for anisotropy. There's a two theta term and a four theta term. Um, both are sort of required by um, looking at, at a, like a full elastic tensor. If you sort of arbitrarily set the four theta term to zero, you're including some assumptions about um, the particular symmetry of, of your material. So on the other hand, four theta terms are usually small, so they often are neglected. But um, there are theoretical connections between four theta terms and potentially like cracks, potentially water filled cracks. Um, I don't know if that physically makes sense to have a whole bunch of like free water in the slab mantle or anything like that, but um, that's definitely something we're looking into. And we're also planning to do some, some synthetic calculations to see if 
it even makes more sense to think of these otter looking curves as maybe a superposition of two different two theta signals um, and how that would actually manifest in our data. So um, yeah, ideas or feedback on that are, are most welcome also. I mean, if it is, if it is water, uh, like your serpentine minerals are gonna have a very different basic elastic set of properties. And so I was thinking that it was a superposition of like maybe it's olivine and serpentine and you can say, boom, there's our water and then therefore earthquakes and then therefore the whole thing is solved. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a fair point. But I guess the question there is also, um, what to what degree you'd expect to see like a direct signal from serpentine in this kind of measurement, right? Especially if you have serpentine confined to narrow fault zones. Um, I don't know how much of its like elastic properties you'd see. I think there's also even some debate as to whether you know the serpentine in a fault zone like that would have an intrinsic fabric or not. Um, so lots of questions. I don't I don't have answers for all of them. Cool. All right. Thanks so much. I don't see any uh, further questions for Hannah right now, but please feel free to keep popping them in in the chat. Uh, but we'll move on to our uh, our next speaker. So maybe uh, Zhang Wen, if you could uh, start sharing your screen as I uh, introduce you here. But um, Zhang Wen Zhang will is an assistant professor in the Seismological Laboratory at Caltech, and he is going to give us a talk entitled "Geophysical Sensing on Submarine Cables." So, Zhang Wen, take it away. Great, thank you. Do you see my screen all right? Okay, great. Yeah, thank you all for coming to the talk. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about geophysical sensing on submarine cable. This is work done uh, by a, a big collaboration among many seismologists, the phys physical oceanographer, fiber optic physicists, and engineers. Uh, some are from Google, some are from universities in Europe. So I hope that I can, by the end of the, uh, today's talk, I can convince you that this big network of telecommunication cables already laid out in the ocean connecting different continents can be used for uh, marine seismology research. So let me, of course, there's still you know, challenges to overcome. Uh, I will start with something you're probably more familiar with by now because there are a few very nice uh, talks about DAS in this symposium. Uh, DAS stands for Disputed Acoustic Sensing. Uh, the basic idea is DAS can convert a long uh, telecom cable into many, many sensors. So every meter of that cable can become a sensor. Uh, it, it does it by you know, injecting laser into the fiber and interrogate the backscatter light. So if the cable is deforming, the backscatter light will change. So um, there are many, many important features for DAS, but I think for marine seismology, the most important part is the equipment is only required at one end. You actually don't need to do anything along the cable. You just need to put the instrument on one end of the cable. And of course, you will choose the land side, right? Like the ones on land. And uh, so that the power, the data telemetry, and also environmental control is all only required on one end. That makes the logistics much, much easier. This technology has been used a lot on land, but you can see because of these advantages, people have been doing uh, that in submarine environment very quickly in the last couple of years. So here I'm just showing some paper that's coming out already. I'm sure there are many more you know, in the review process or in preparation process. So some of these are done by Led Lindsay uh, in the Monterey Bay. This is the second one is what we did in uh, offshore Belgium. This is in South uh, uh, France by uh, Slayton et al. And there's another one by uh, Spica et al. in Tohoku region. And then there's an, another very recent one in the Lankai subduction zone. Uh, so in this particular case, you can see there is a cable showing at the line here connecting some ocean bottom sensors. So it's a cable observatory. And now the cable is being converted into a DAS array along the red portion that is about 50 kilometers. So I'm not going to dive into any of this because there's so much material there. Just to show you a very spectacular uh, figure from Ida et al's figure, uh, the recent paper. So the top figure is showing the best symmetry of that 50 kilometer cable. And this cable is converted to about 10,000 sensors in five meter spacing. And uh, if you look at the previous figure here, you can see there is a magnitude 2.89 earthquake, about maybe 1500 kilometers away from the cable. And you can see the P wave 
and the S wave very nicely captured by the entire table, right? And you can maybe notice that to the right end, you don't see the P and S wave very well, uh, you know, close to the dust unit. This is because it's in a shallow water, so the ocean wave is so strong, it dominates the entire signal, right? And as you go kind of further and further into the cable, the noise is indeed getting higher just because of the back scatter light uh, is not decaying. Uh, but you can see, you know, for a magnitude three earthquake, seeing so clearly the PNS uh, at that distance is quite remarkable. Of course, this cable is generating one terabyte of data every day. Um, and, uh, um, and uh, you know, as a you know, summary for submarine dust, uh, all these uh, current studies and new studies coming up, they are mostly using about 20 to 50 kilometers of pre-existing cables. Uh, and mostly actually was designed for research purpose, like a cable observatories, and turned them into thousands of sensors. And the uh, different studies are looking at different things, but everyone is observing earthquake waves, uh, hydroacoustic waves, microseism, ocean waves, ocean current. I mean, there are going to be more being detected, but the basic idea is the sensitivity of submarine dust is great and the spatial resolution is great. So there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, interesting findings from this very dense arrays. And all of these are, you know, are relatively straightforward to do because, you know, the cable has already been laid down. That's the expensive part. But at this point, you may say, wow, we already have everything we need. Let's build that, you know, global submarine dust network. Um, Unfortunately, that's not quite the case. If you think about how big the ocean is, a 50 kilometer cable is really just a tiny bit uh, near the coast. Of course, that can be very important, like Gerard mentioned about, you know, those slope uh, failures. Uh, those are within, you know, tens of kilometers. So that's, this is already very useful. But, you know, if you want to do it globally, what, what is the limitation with us? It turns out that these long haul cables connecting different continents are very different from the shorter ones we are using today. Uh, they are very, very expensive. It usually takes more than $100 million to deploy, and uh, you need a big ship to do it. And the cables are really thick, so they're very well protected, as shown to the right. There are layers and layers of protections. But it turns out in those cables, you only have a few strands of fiber. On land, usually you have like 100 strands of fiber just because they're cheap. But once you do it in the ocean, you need to add repeaters in the ocean, which is an expensive process. They usually only deploy what they need, right? And the dust method requires a dark fiber, at least at the moment. That means you are taking, if there is only a four strand of fiber, you are taking a quarter of their capacity, a 100 or 400 million dollar investment, right? And the dust also use, uh, you know, their back scatter lights interrogate. That means you cannot pass the first repeater, even if your instrument is good, uh, so that the first the back scatter light won't come back to you. So it's a 10,000 kilometer cable. You can only use 100 kilometer on both ends. That a, seems a big waste, right? So if you sort of summarize, uh, you know, dust, the uh, quality in this kind of diamond here, it has perfect sensitivity, has a great resolution. Well, in terms of scalability, just because you have to have a dark fiber, this is not really easy to do. And the coverage is not great either when you think about the, you know, the entire ocean. But of course, again, there are a lot of interesting process uh, near coast. So could there be another way that gave us a better coverage so we can go to the middle of the ocean? Well, you may also heard of this other study, Mara et al. on science in 2018, uh, uh, presented a method called ultra-stable laser interferometry. This is a completely different method. What it does is basically use an extremely sensitive laser, let it uh, propagate along a long cable and come back to the source region and interfere with the source laser so that you can measure the total travel time of the laser along a very long cable extremely accurately. And then if there's an earthquake you know, wave hitting the cable somewhere, then maybe the low total length of the cable is changing so slightly, right? So they were actually able to measure this even in submarine environment. This was uh, you know, a cable about uh, 100 kilometer long uh, offshore Italy. And uh, there is an earthquake, it's a magnitude 3.4 earthquake about 90 kilometer away. And you can see in the middle trace here, the red line showing a very clear observation 
of this uh, signal. And the top and bottom are showing land-based stations. You can see the displacement from the earthquake is on the ma one micron scale. So they basically measured one micron length change of the cable over 100 kilometers of, of cable. Right? So that's amazing. And the good thing about this method, if you have a long cable, because they're not using back scatter light, you are measuring the total lens change, you're using direct wave, so that you can do this with however long cable you want, even if there are repeaters in between. So if you sort of summarize the, the technical aspect of this, it does not take away your, your cable right, or, or, or fiber. It just need a one bandwidth of that, uh, but it does require a special instrument. You need an ultra-stable laser there. The laser they use is amazing. The line width of the laser is one hertz compared with the regular telecom laser, that line width is 5,000 or 10,000 times of that. So extremely accurate instrument. So if you can add that to the cable and even add atomic clock to time the parts, you can turn a long cable to an instrument. So if again, you summarize this by this diamond here, the coverage of that is great. The sensitivity is also quite excellent. Uh, not as good as that, but you know, measuring one micron over you know, hundreds of kilometers, that's quite, quite sensitive. The resolution is not great because it's a, a integrated measurement. You are measuring the total length change of the cable. You, even if you only have one cable, it's actually hard to tell where the shaking is actually happening. It can happen anywhere on the cable. The scalability may also be an issue just because you actually need a very sophisticated instrument and you need to add this to the telecom operator's house, right? Their facility. And they are usually quite sensitive about adding anything uh, to their system, right? Well, why, why do it, right? So then the question is, can we find another way that has the coverage, but hopefully a little bit more scalable uh, than both DAS and the, uh, this phase approach? Well, that's something we worked on uh, in the last uh, kind of year or so. It's a new possibility. Uh, instead of monitoring the phase information of the laser, we try to monitor the polarization of the laser. Well, the polarization is just basically, you know, light is a wave, it's the orientation of the oscillation of the electric uh, magnetic waves. Uh, it turns out because there are so few strands of fiber in each cable, the telecom operators always try to do more with their cable. So they actually develop something called a polarization multiplexing, sending out two signals at the same time out of the same channel, just given they have orthogonal polarization, so they double their capacity. To do that, they need to measure the polarization all the time. Well, that can be data for us because if a cable is being perturbed, for example, if you bend it, you stretch it, you twist it, the polarization would also change, right? So, so basically now the picture is if you have a long submarine cable from you know, transmitter to the receiver side, the ocean is so quiet, there's no temperature variation, not much mechanical perturbation. So the laser polarization will stay stable uh, on the receiver end, as long as the input is stable. But when there is an earthquake, the fiber is being, you know, stressed, then the polarization will change. So that's the new idea here. And we actually tried this for this 10,000 kilometer fiber optical cable called Curie uh, by Google. They use it to connect their data centers in Los Angeles and Chile. So this is showing uh, the red line here. Uh, of course, this you know cable pass you know, along many important subduction zones. All the blue dots are magnet larger than 7.5 earthquake in the last 100 years. And many of them are very, very damaging, even caused big tsunamis. And during the nine months of testing we did, we actually detected a, a few dozen earthquakes showing at their yellow stars using polarization. So the biggest one was the 7.7 Jamaica earthquake, but the closer one is the uh, 7.4 Mexico earthquake last June. And the smallest earthquake we detect was a magnitude 4.4 earthquake. We detect essentially because it's right underneath the cable. Uh, so most of the cases we detect earthquakes are bigger than about magnitude 5.5. I can show you an example of that. So we use something called the uh, Stokes parameter to describe the polarization. You can think of it just as using three, uh, and three parameters on a, a, a unit sphere to describe the orientation of the oscillation, right? So uh, there is S1, S2, and S3, and you can see 
their, uh, their earthquake was, this was the magnitude 7.4 earthquake detected very nicely on the polarization. So the red line here is showing you their earthquake origin time. And uh, here, you know, I'm not going to the details here, but we rotate the focal, the, the unit sphere so that S1, S2 are around zero and S3 is around one. Basically, you only have two orientations and we have three parameters, so only two of them are independent here. So, and I also showed another red line here is there uh, another seismic station on land at about the same distance to the earthquake as the closest point along the cable. You can see the envelope that shows a fairly short duration, right? Like about 300, 400 seconds, everything stopped already. If you look at the polarization measurement, ours lasts you know, a few times more than that. It actually lasts about half an hour. Uh, why is that? This comes to the intrinsic integrative nature of polarization. So maybe after 300 seconds, the shaking at the closest point along the cable already stopped, but the seismic is still propagating. So it's perturbing other part of this 10,000 kilometer cable now. So it's continuing to perturb their, uh, uh, their polarization. So that's why we see such a long signal. As you can imagine, this is not a very good news for seismologists. It would be hard to detect, you know, PS wave and the surface wave. We do have some cases where the earthquake is far enough. We can see the P and S wave separately, but keep in mind, this has to be an uh, integrated measurement, just like their uh, phase approach. So again, summarize the technical aspect, you know, this polarization based approach, not only it doesn't take, you know, a, a fiber, it doesn't even take a channel, right? It's using whatever telecommunication is going on in the cable. And the telecom operators are already mirroring their polarization. All we are asking is to output that polarization so that we can analyze it uh, for earthquake research or, or other uh, you know, physical processes in the ocean. So it's an extremely scalable uh, approach, uh, you know, in many, cables, especially new cables around the world, this is probably can be done very quickly if they are willing to do so. So again, come back to this uh, uh, diamond here, this uh, orange one showing the polarization, you have excellent coverage, just as good as the phase approach. It's very scalable because it does not require any new instrument there. And the data, the polarization is actually not uh, contain any information about the telecom signal, the content. So it's fairly safe to do so. Uh, and it's probably going to be very useful for monitoring large earthquakes and maybe tsunami uh, in the future while still are working on that aspect. Unfortunately, the sensitivity is not great. Uh, so far, you know, it's a fairly, uh, you know, still relatively noisy compared with DAS and FACE. We only measure relatively large earthquakes. So this is probably more useful for kind of earthquake earning warning or tsunami earning warning purpose. Um, but the resolution is also much worse than even the phase approach because the phase approach, they can actually use the travel time of the light to locate approximately where it's happening. And they need to sample at 2.5 million times every second to do that. And uh, you cannot convince you know, a telecom operator to sample their polarization at that kind of rate. Uh, so that's basically you know, the comparison of these three uh, methods. So in summary, I think there's actually a very promising future for submarine uh, uh, fiber uh, sensing. Uh, there are actually multiple emerging technology now, uh, including DAS, phase, polar, uh, polarization. And also I didn't mention smart cable because you know, that one you actually add a sensor there. Here I'm focusing on where you're actually using fiber itself for the sensing. Who knows, maybe there will be even new method uh, for uh, fiber sensing. I hope I convince you also that they also have a different complementary kind of nature in terms of their sensitivity, resolution, coverage, and scalability. Um, so maybe for any particular science question or region, you would want to have a cocktail solution in some sense, right? Like how people are you know, uh, dealing with COVID these days, right? Like using a cocktail approach to combine multiple methods together so that you have sort of the both the kind of coverage and resolution sensitivity and hopefully it's more uh, scalable too. So I think there is a very promising future here. So with that, I want to thank you and take any questions. Thank you so much for that fabulous talk. That was excellent. Um, any questions? Everyone's thinking about the cocktail now. <laughs> I'll jump in. 
I got a quick question for you. So right now it sounds like this is a lot of very, very private partnership, sort of, or, or maybe not private, but like exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, how do you suggest anyone who wants to get involved with this go about doing it? You know, are, are telecom companies really open to this or is this sort of, you know, a PR move? Like how do you actually see this uh, moving forward to the broader community? Right, that's a great question. You know, it's uh, even in our case, it's very, you know, case by case, right? Depending on who you're dealing with. And uh, I would say, you know, if I have, you know, my gut feeling is that there's gonna be a two stage process. The, the first stage is gonna be shorter cables near coast, and maybe they're mostly a research cable, for example, owned by NSF, right? Or owned by some other research unit, then they will be probably much more willing to share uh, the cable for research purpose. And at some point, if that is getting mature, right, people really see what you learn from that. And that's where maybe there could be a push uh, to the, from the community or maybe from government agents uh, to the telecom industry. Uh, the reason is that the telecom industry is actually not, um, you know, of course the resource is limited. They are often more concerned about the permitting issues and so on, so they are willing to care, but they don't want to get into trouble in some times, in some sense, right? But if in some day, right, the government said, this is something you have to do, well, they would be willing to do it, right? So I think this is probably a two-step pro two process, you know, to, to start from easy and then get everyone familiar with it, both the scientists, fiber engineers, the government agencies, Navy probably also, right? So everyone to be familiar with it and then there will be more momentum. Great, thanks so much. Um, Emily, you had your hand up before? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll ask a quick question. And um, so like, thank you very much. This, that was a great overview and really interesting to think about the kind of future possibilities. Um, and I think my question kind of builds from Colton It'll maybe a little bit more specific even, but, um, and I also apologies, apologies. I probably could, I'm kind of new and I probably haven't felt literature as much as I should have, but I'm just wondering about for these different technologies, if you have a feel for sort of the potential future, like latency involved with these and or what the obstacles would be in having really quick um, information on an event, like an earthquake, for example, that was being recorded. And I'm thinking about, you know, things like earthquake early warning that would um, benefit from from like large, large, large events being detected offshore quickly. Um, right, that's a great question. So uh, I, I, there, all this method all have a real time telemetry, right? So essentially the measurement is only done at the end of the cable. And the information, the, the scatter light or direct light, they're all propagating light speed from where the perturbation is happening to your interrogation unit, right? So, and then the telemetry is only matters for where you have the uh, interrogation unit. For example, the, uh, the polarization approach we are doing with Google, like the data is coming back in, in real time. We, do, we even have a particular example offshore Mexico uh, because our cable was closer to a, a magnitude five or something earthquake than the nearest coastal station by a lot. We actually you know, detect the earthquake way, you know, uh, tens of seconds before uh, you know, the first land station detected the earthquake. So I think there's a lot of potential for earthquake or even tsunami early warning. It's really exciting. Thanks. And let's do one more question from uh, John Orcutt. Yes, I, I, it was a really, really great talk. Um, I guess I, the question is the cable that you're talking about is relatively short. And it, it, is it possible that one could use a much smaller ship like a research ship to actually lay cable like that? That would uh, actually cut down costs quite a lot looking off the California coast and early warning various things you talked about. Absolutely great question. Um, I don't know their permitting process very well. Uh, the idea is if it's a, a telecom cable, you sort of very complicated permitting process. But I also heard that if it's a, you know, maybe it's for research purpose and it's a shorter cable in a particular region, uh, maybe that's much less of an issue. So I think there actually may be a lot of opportunity there that no one has really explored. Um, so, for example, using a smaller uh, ship and uh, deploy a, a cable, you know, uh, to do that 
experiment. Um, yeah, I, I don't know more about that, but I think there's a great opportunity there. Yeah, I, I do too. Um, the permitting thing is always difficult, but it's certainly done all the time. And there's a lot of expertise on this. It still wouldn't, uh, I don't think would be a terrible expense, but it would be an expense to the problem. But uh, it seems to me it's really worth uh, taking a look at this. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we can definitely talk more about that later. Great. Well, thanks so much again for that fabulous talk. It looks like there's still some um, questions coming in the chat, but in the interest of time, we're going to move to our uh, our final speaker, and maybe we can come back to some of those things in the discussion at the end. Um, so um, maybe Wen Yuan, if you can start to share your screen, I can uh, introduce you. Um, Wen Yuan Fan is an assistant professor at Scripps at UC uh, San Diego, and he's going to um, give a talk entitled Abundant Submarine Landslides in the Gulf of Mexico. So take it away. Well, thank you, Donna, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, the organizing committee and also the session organizers for inviting me here. So this really has been a great um, meeting. I really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. And also thank you for all the audience for still uh, sticking around. It's really, you know, for the last talk of any real meeting, there are like five people left. So we're doing great. Um, I think there are over 60 people here. So excellent. Today, I will talk about some real landslides in the Gulf of Mexico. But before I start, I first would like to acknowledge my co-authors. Well, the papers we will discuss, uh, research is truly really collaborative efforts in nature as shown by previous talks. So I am very grateful for all the opportunities. So when we talk about uh, um, natural hazards in the Gulf of Mexico, perhaps the first thing would come into mind would be something like human-induced natural hazard and hurricane. For example, this 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill uh, was a really bad example. And to date, we're still dealing with some of the consequences. Um, but when we talk about natural hazard, um, perhaps um, we only focus on hurricane, but not too much about the geohazard uh, offshore. And that's fair. Uh, this is an example of showing all the seismicity larger than three uh, in the region. And you see the most uh, prominent one is a magnitude 2.9 earthquake. So hardly we have any impact for events in this region. So does that mean, um, you know, I don't need to worry about that. That's other people's problem. And as a marine seismologist, it's not my problem. Our problem, I should say. Um, and the answer is no. Um, it is our problem. And I will show you that actually only us can help to solve these problems. There are abundant submarine landslides in the Gulf of Mexico. Here, as shown in the bathymetry map, uh, we have uh, various subsizes occurring uh, along the uh, continental shelf. As a matter of fact, the largest submarine landslide are, uh, around the U.S. margin occurred on the uh, Texas slope. So there are consequences, right? So after a submarine landslide, offshore infrastructures can be destroyed. For example, cables. Uh, and in the Gulf of Mexico, the thing that would get destroyed are the uh, platforms. So this is an example. Um, this is a platform uh, site of Taylor Energy that was destroyed by a submarine landslide. And it, ha it has been leaking oil uh, ever since the event occurred in uh, 2004. So, but why don't we hear too much about submarine landslides in that region? Um, besides other reason, reasons, perhaps uh, one possibility is they don't occur that often, um, right? So if they don't occur that often, that was a rare incident, and we don't need to worry too much about that. Um, but the truth is, we don't know. Um, some of the most basic questions are still up in the air. We do not know when or where do they tend to occur not to mention uh, why did they occur, right? So there is a huge knowledge gap here between what happened and why they happened. And now as a marine seismologist, I, I feel this is our responsibility. And the reason for that is, you know, this is a question of location and timing, right? So as seismologists, this is what we do. We're really best at dealing with event location and resolving uh, a, a event occurrence here. With the novel surface wave detector, we detected 85 seismic sources offshore uh, in the Gulf of Mexico occurring from 2008 to 2015. And these events could generate coherent transcontinental surface wave fields, and they are likely to be submarine landslides. 
Now, this is an example um, by what I mean, coherent transcontinental surface wave field. The red square is detected event, and you see the colored dots are uh, subarrays with each, uh, three stations. The color represents arrival time, uh, centroid arrival time of relay waves. The arrows show the propagation direction. The thin lines are gray circle paths, and the uh, ellipse show the uncertainty range. So how do we get this? The idea is actually quite straightforward. Assuming we have a wave propagating towards one of the subarray with three stations, for example, S1 to 3, and then we can take advantage of the local coherence of the intermediate period surface waves by cross-correlating the wave waveforms to get a delay time, and then knowing the location separations, we can resolve the propagation direction and the thin um, uh, uh, arrival time of the subarray easily. So simple trigonometry. Now by doing that for each subarray independently, and then we can piece everything up into a wave field. Now with the wave field, uh, it's not a very difficult to solve where the locations uh, is from because surface waves uh, are nicely propagating along the Earth's surface. To gain no more knowledge of the summary line side of, of this example event, we can check the record section. Uh, the most prominent features here is the long duration of the release waves. With uh, just a MS of 3.5, what we observe here is over 10 minutes uh, duration of the record. This is very different from uh, records from earthquakes. So here I'm showing you, showing you another two record section of uh, waves uh, propagating across a similar epicentral range from earthquakes, uh, but you see the durations are much, much shorter. To understand the mechanisms, we can try to model it. Now, uh, unlike the typical double couple moment tensor solution to resolve earthquakes, centroid uh, um, summary landslides or landslides can be best described as centroid single forces. Now, imagine this yellow box as a, a summary landslide sliding downhill. Now, the mass movement will have a loading and unloading effects to the ground, and because of that, there will be an acceleration and deceleration process in the force history. Now, with that, we can assume the force history as simple boxcars. With the force history assumption, then we can invert it from the observations. Now, on the lower right corner is an example source model of the satellite imagery, and on the left side is a waveform fetch. You see, they look really good. Now, we did a similar thing. So using regional radius and the low waves, we can resolve a very simple boxcar model of this submarine landslide. And the model suggests the event slides uh, towards the northeast direction uh, and with an empirical scaling relationship. This model suggests that this landslide um, moved about 62 million tons of sediments and rocks. So the event occurs occurred at the uh, foot of a continental slope where the uh, asymmetric gradient seems to be quite steep um, and that, that likely uh, contributed to the initiation of the process. But I do want to point out is that our location at this moment is not good enough to do a direct comparison with detailed morphological features from bathymetry. And the reason for that is all our stations are far, far away on land and we do not have any offshore OBS observations. To further confirm the hypothesis, we can com uh, compare the radiation pattern. So here I'm showing you the release over log wave amplitude ratio. And what uh, the figure tries to tell you is that uh, our preferred model prediction can explain all the observations uh, uh, within 20 degree at almost all azimuths. So this further gives me some confidence about the centroid um, single force model. Um, and further conf confirms the landslide uh, hypothesis. So this kind of event would occur almost spontaneously without any preceding events. And we detected about 10 with a cluster around the northern part of the Gulf. But when something happens uh, nearby, another earthquake, uh, they can trigger submarine landslides in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so here is an example magnitude 5.5 earthquake occurring in the Gulf of California. Um, and you see these uh, two panels share the same color bar. Soon after this event, there was another event occurring in the Gulf of California, uh, uh, Mexico. And the two event separation um, is about 1,500 kilometers, and they were separated about 435 seconds. Now, with the distance and time, 
what we conclude is the occurrence of the submarine landslide in the Gulf of Mexico seems to coincide with the passage of the surface waves from the first earthquake. Now, because of the paucity of anything happening um, seismically in the Gulf of Mexico, this coincidence suggests the second event was dynamically triggered by the first event due to the passing seismic waves. Here, I really wanna point out one thing is, this is not your typical near field type earthquake landslide triggering processes. Uh, like Jared mentioned, uh, you need earthquakes to be relatively close, cause relatively strong ground motion sometimes. The peak ground acceleration needs to reach one, one, one G. Uh, and what we're talking about here are two events separated over 1500 kilometers away and the stress perturbation to the maximum are only on the kilopascal scale. And the case I showed you, that was not a rare case. In total, we observed 75 dynamically triggered summer landslides occurring in the Gulf of Mexico from 2008 to 2015. And you see there is a clustering happening in the nor northwestern part of the Gulf where the seafloor topography is rather complex. So this is not an easy process and multiple things could happen as I will show you later. All the triggering earthquakes are from the Pacific plate boundary or most of them. What's interesting is the majority of these events seems to be strike slip events and which radiation pattern would cause very large uh, surface waves in the Gulf of Mexico, either for Rayleigh's wave or love wave. And we do not observe a triggering magnitude limit for the lower part, uh, lower bound. The smallest triggering earthquake can be as small as 4.9 and things we are only comparing with the GCMT catalog this magnitude is approaching the magnitude of completeness and we expect it could be even smaller. All the events are very shallow. To understand the mechanisms, we can plot the triggering pairs in a distance versus time plot. The horizontal axis is the separation distance between the earthquake and the trigger slides. The um, vertical axis is the uh, separation time. Now each dot represents one pair and the color represents a main shock azimuth and of course the air bars are from statistical analysis. To put things into perspective, we can plot them on top of uh, phase moveouts. So before we jump into the details, I guess first I need to tell you uh, two things. First is uh, why they're triggered and second is why they're dynamically triggered. Now they're triggered because there is really nothing much happening seismically in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And uh, the fact we observe 75 cases that coincide with the passing seismic waves suggests statistically, it's very, very unlikely to be random, but more likely to be causally related. And they're dynamically triggered because the passing seismic waves were the only energy source or uh, to provide some sort of a stress perturbation during that time range. Now with that, what do we learn? Uh, the first thing is these events were likely triggered by the surface waves, as indicated by this move out line. And they were likely triggered immediately with a very short or basically no delay time. We do not observe magnitude dependence, as I have mentioned earlier, and this potentially suggests that the peak dynamic string or stress is not the only triggering uh, threshold that plays a role in initiating these dynamically triggered events. We do observe a distance limit though. All the triggering earthquakes are within 40 degrees of the Gulf of Mexico. So this perhaps suggests a frequency dependent triggering mechanism. Uh, that means the further away the earthquakes, the less high frequency ground motion they can generate in the Gulf of Mexico. And these events potentially require some, some sort of a high frequency ground motion to set them off. Now in total, we observe 85 events from 2008 to 2015, 10 spontaneous and 75 dynamically triggered. The only thing that we have more in the Gulf of Mexico would be the oil platforms show as these yellow dots. Now, this is actionable science. Um, and the reason for that is, as you can see on the left side, a lot of the submarine landslide occurrence location co-locate with the active exploration leasing sites. And I feel quite strongly about this. And I think our efforts as marine seismologists could help, marine geophysicists could help the planning efforts uh, uh, to understand the hazard and mitigate them. 
So to communicate to the agencies and stakeholders, we need to tell them why and how, and therefore why they should pay attention to us or, or, or work with us. Now, mechanically, for a seismically detectable landslide to um, occur, it needs to move fast, move as a block, and move along a weak zone. So the um, Gulf of Mexico, which is a very complexly structured ocean basin, has very thick sediment, really provides the fundamentals. It has a very high um, sedimentation rate, so the rapid sedimentation accumulation would easily create overly steep topography and causing unstable environmental stress. And that will lead to overpressurization, uh, which potentially will cause fractures or cause it to be unstable. Now, gas hydrate could be another possibility. It could either dissociate or create weak zones because of the bending. Uh, now, also because of the, uh, uh, the weak oil layers or water layers are present, uh, and in addition to groundwater and all seepage could create sliding surfaces, which could further facilitate the development of the submarine landslides. Well, the dynamically triggered submarine landslides, um, the reasons are because of the prolonged ground motion. The reason for that is uh, quite simple because the Gulf of Mexico is a large basin, right? So this is basin effect. When waves come in, they don't get out. They're trapped there and last for a long time. Now, prolonged ground motion will lead to cyclic shearing, which will cause plastic strain accumulation, effectively will reduce material strength and eventually potentially lead to the observed summer landslides. Also, cyclic shearing will change the permeability, which probably contribute to the uh, triggering processes as well. All these hypotheses are testable if we have in situ near field geophysical observations. But at this moment, I cannot tell you which one is more likely because we do not have any in situ near field um, OBS observations. Now data equals knowledge and knowledge leads to power. Now we have no data, which means we have very limited understanding of submarine landslides in the region. And that also means we're really at the mercy of the nature for mitigating uh, preventing such hazards. So I don't want to lead it in a sad note of saying we have no stations. Let me try to end it as a high note showing you when we have a decent uh, network or observation, what can we do with that? So here is a sub aerial landslide that was detected by the FNAT in Japan. With the network, we were able to detect a landslide within five kilometers um, of the ground truth location. And also with that, our seismically inferred model can explain the momentum, total mass, and the energy loss uh, that agree very well with uh, in-situ observations. So in this talk, I showed you there are landslides in the Gulf of Mexico, and, and, and they're quite sensitive to external stress perturbations. This is kind of a scary thing, but at the same time, it is also a very exciting or interesting phenomena. Um, this really shows the marine system is very dynamic and energetic. And I believe a marine seismologist is really at the forefront to make this world a better and safer place. And thank you. I will take any questions that you have. What a fabulous note to end on for our, fa for our symposium. Thank you so much, Win Wan. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, maybe we have time for one quick question. Uh, we've had so much great discussion, we've gone a bit long. I see one, one hand, uh, uh, Zhang, Zhang Wen. Yeah, I have a quick question. So, so yeah, that's very nice. So you, you assumed that the, the source time function to be this uh, box car positive and negative, and that it have the same duration. I remember for some of the terrestrial landslide, they're very asymmetric. Uh, do you think the physics may be different in these two cases? Well, no one think no one uh, think it's boxcar, right? So boxcar is, is just a bad thing I can do at the moment with the data. Um, the you are absolutely correct. With uh, for for sub aerial landslide, what what we have what we have uh, learned is is it can be rather complex. It can take multiple turns. It can have asymmetric uh, 
with the peak and the duration. The only thing that controls it is it has to be, the force has to be balanced. The net, net force goes to zero, but you can you, you, you know really move it around. But the the thing at this moment is we don't have um, uh, near field data to constrain the details. Therefore, um, I'm brutal force forcing it to be a simplistic boxcar. Um, so that's just what I can do at the moment. Right. Do you, do you have any physical understanding of the duration? For example, you have this one that's 65 million tons, and I see the number of duration is like 10 seconds, right? It's very short for, so it's just the entire thing sleep a little bit and then just stop right there. No, I don't, I, I don't think so. I, I think you asked a very important question is the boxcar um, model assumption has very uh, limited temporal resolutions. In particular, all my stations are six or 700 kilometers away and I use the intermediate period surface waves to model it. You know, once I filter it, it doesn't matter anymore whether it's long or short. So that leads to a shorter estimation. But given the surface waves lasted over 10 minutes, um, I, I would not expect it to be a short event. Okay, great, thank you. Right, I wish we had more time for uh, questions. There's some coming in in the chat, but I encourage you to reach out to, um, to Wen Yuan or any of our other speakers with further questions uh, after this. But now um, the final part of our wrap up session were some summaries of the um, special interest groups. And so I'll turn it over to, uh, to Casey or maybe back to myself. Sorry, okay, yes, I think, can you see this full screen now? Great, so if you wanna take it away, we'll just um, go through very quick uh, one minute summaries of, of what was covered in the special interest groups so that everyone can uh, benefit from those discussions. Great, um, thanks so much. So I, I can, uh, I'll say 30 seconds on a special interest group that happened earlier this morning. It was focused on marine seismic needs for um, SC4D. If we could go to the next slide. I hope that um, many of you have had a chance to either attend our, um, our SIG today or previous town halls. And if you have, then you know that we're aspiring to, <coughs> excuse me, have a quite grand um, effort that would include a large marine seismology component. So please, um, we've been posting lots of things on the um, website, sc4d.org, and please um, email us with any feedback and ideas that you have on um, what we should be thinking about. So thanks. Thanks, Donna. And if you, I know you have to run, so <laughs> thank you again for running this session too with uh, Emily. Um, okay, I don't know, I can't quite see who's um, around. Um, is Helen able to unmute? Yep, I'm here. Great. Yeah, so uh, we had a SIG on uh, broadband OBS data processing um, where we did an overview of common sources of noise on uh, OBS, uh, broadband OBS instruments um, as an introduction for people perhaps working with this data for the first time and ran two tutorial sessions um, of the uh, attacker code, which is a code for removing Tilson compliance noise um, available in both MATLAB and Python if you're interested in um, this code, uh, you can go to the website available there um, to uh, see references to both the MATLAB and Python versions of that code. And uh, yeah, that's it. Great, thanks. Right, one of the Sean's, whichever one gets to it first. <laughs> sure, yeah, so we had a, um, uh, a really great uh, couple of hour uh, meeting on um, small source seismics, basically high resolution uh, of broadly described everything from chirp to uh, 3D P cable kind of uh, work. And I think the many different take homes came out of this, um, that there were more education is needed on the low energy sources, many examples of ad hoc behind the scenes sort of sharing of, of equipment and things like that. Um, and that the community, while we have a lot of equipment, there are some gaps and there's definitely a lack of coordination, the ability to share equipment and tech, technical capabilities uh, across um, our community. And so I think some outcomes of this is that, you know, we have a questionnaire we can now show to uh, funding agencies and there's a lot of interest in gathering the same group of people and anybody else who's interested out there um, into some kind of mailing list and maybe eventually work up towards supporting some kind of central office or coordination uh, capability uh, in this arena. Great, great, thanks. And sorry, I can't copy and paste those things in the chat, but we will definitely uh, make them available in an email to follow up. All right, next, Carrie. 
Yeah, Samara and I, and I had a um, special interest group on frontiers in marine electromagnetics. The idea with this session was to review uh, recent research results uh, using marine EM, particularly marine EM methods when used in conjunction with seismology. We had six talks uh, that span from using EM and passive seismic data to image the mantle and mid-ocean ridges, another talk on using passive and active source EM at subduction zones, uh, a couple of talks on imaging offshore groundwater systems on the continental shelf with EM data, and then a talk on joint uh, stochastic seismic and EM inversion that used uh, like a Bayesian type method with fuzzy mean clustering clusters to uh, link seismic velocity and, and EM resistivity. And then finally, we concluded with a talk on marine EM equipment. And we then had a 30 minute discussion that kind of focused around equipment and how um, many of the recent and pending NSF sponsored projects to collect marine EM data involve um, PIs and early career investigators at many different institutions. And all of us are relying on the Scripps uh, Marine EM instrumentation fleet that's managed by Steve Constable. And we rely on not only the instruments and the, the technicians and continued support for this uh, center is really vital for new research and training the next generation. And this is a facility that's not uh, funded directly by NSF, it's funded on a per project basis, but we wanna make sure that that uh, center is, remains around. And so if you're interested in marine EM data or you have experience with it, or you just wanna learn more, please fill out the uh, questionnaire that we have there because we're really trying to get a gauge on uh, how much support is out there for continuing uh, this type of research. Thanks. Great, thank you. And I'll take this last one and just to sort of bookend this with uh, Avrea's great talk on undergrad research and, and broadening our community. Um, we had a um, special interest group meeting on justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this was run and organized by Lindsay uh, Worthington and myself. And I thought it was a great um, discussion. It was really um, dynamic, a lot, of, um, a lot of feedback. And we used these jam boards that are now available for everyone to view. And I really encourage you to go look at those and read some of the comments in there because it's really important um, feedback from the community here. And really it's mainly to um, try to create a, a more inclusive environment, um, not just at sea, but at sea was part of it. Um, it's definitely a, a, an environment that um, perhaps needs, needs some work. Um, we also wanted to um, work on de-emphasizing the at sea that you don't have to go to sea to work. There's, there's data, just tons of data out there and um, there's career options and transferable skills here. So, you know, how, how can we best attract people to this field? And um, I will say that this has generally been largely a pre-tenure and student-led effort, and, um, but this work is for everyone. So we encourage everybody to get involved um, and that mentoring is hugely helpful at all stages for that. So thanks so much for that. I think that's the last SIG and I will stop sharing. Um, I know we're a little bit over, but I, I'll just take a couple more minutes of your time if you don't mind me doing so. Um, to make some final remarks. So thank you everyone for, for being here. I think it's been a fantastic couple of weeks, certainly been um, quite a lot. Um, I wanted to just do a quick announcements. Um, the posters that you see next Monday um, are just listed there because they did not request a live session, um, but please go check those out. There are some great recordings in there and um, please check out the other poster posters that are available, click on the files tab, watch those videos that are there. All of this content will be available for a full year for viewing comments and discussion. Um, the session recordings are available on the event pages under that files tab. Those will be made available to a wider audience via YouTube after the symposium. If you haven't made a new connection in this meeting yet, what? Go make a new connection, um, reach out to someone, comment on a poster in the chat, email someone about their presentation or their research, get in touch with an NSF program manager or a facility operator and start a dialogue. We might not see each other for a little bit, so this is the time to go and talk with each other and, and um, you know, get some face-to-face -face time outside of this symposium too. Um, I'm gonna post in a survey link for everyone to please fill out. I know there's surveys upon surveys right now, but this is really important for us to hear back from you. 
um, we want to hear from you about your experience in this symposium. And this feedback that you provide will not just inform future marine seismology events, but we will also be sharing these lessons with um, organizers of other virtual events in our community. So we know your time and energy is valuable, and we want to make sure that future events are run as efficiently and effectively as possible. So please do fill that out, and that will be helpful to a larger audience, not just the organizing team for this symposium. Um, finally, thank you to National Science Foundation for funding this symposium, to the members of the organizing committee and special interest group conveners, tutorial leads and guides, poster session conveners, and presenters who made this all possible. Thank you especially to Jinwan Gong and Liam Moser, who organized the early career event along with Masako Tomonaga. Thank you to Kristen Poitra and Molly Statz, who helped keep things running smoothly behind the scenes. And that's it. <laughs> We're done. So thank you very much. And thank you, Casey. <laughs>